We met geez, about a year ago, uh, just about, and common friends. Uh, and of course, as I got a little bit of your story, I discovered that your formative training, your, your years uh, as a student in the K-12 uh, arena, uh, were, were at least partially influenced by the liberal arts, and I wish you could just tell us a little bit about that before we talk about your, your expertise and your work now uh, at an institution of higher ed. So how did you come into uh, the liberal arts, if you will? Sure, I'm happy to discuss it. So I'd always been interested in the sciences since I was a kid. I mm -hmm. had my own chemistry lab and I don't know, scared dogs in the neighborhood by blowing up things. <laughs> um, and uh, when I was 12, i grown up in, in Maryland. When I was 12, we moved to Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I, entered, I was in public schools before in Memphis. My parents put me in private schools. And uh, these private schools, uh, particularly Memphis University School, where I went starting in grade seven hmm. through high school, uh, was very strong in sciences. Uh, but it was also very strong in humanities and liberal arts. Right. And so I just grew up in kind of an idyllic uh, world of education where I didn't even imagine anything would be different. Sure. And so you then went off to college uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, right? MIT. That's right. What did you discover there in terms of the liberal arts? Well, um, first of all, I say my one regret is that I never went to college because MIT is in institute but right, uh, right. so I was institutionalized for uh, four years <laughs> um, but well I was uh, a little bit surprised I was quite surprised I would say uh, at MIT I certainly been sold on science and technology sure. and certainly it was excellent wonderful mentors fantastic classes mm -hmm. mentors of research um, but I, what, one other thing I was sold on was that MIT has a requirement of eight humanities classes, okay. one per semester on average. They're actually humanities, arts, and social sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found was it was very difficult to find a kind of class that kind of talked to me, spoke to me. I was interest, very interested in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And just the philosophy classes, just I couldn't get engaged with them. And uh, one of the reasons is they were certainly not great books focused. Hmm. Is, it, uh, is it true to say then that, that that great books focus had somehow bis been misplaced or displaced? What, uh, what was there in, in lieu of that for that eight course sequence? So, so I think there still are some discussion of books and literature. Right. But for the most part, and I should emphasize, it's not a sequence, basically it's ah. a selection. There are right. maybe 200 classes, something like that. Maybe it's pick 100. And, choose, right. and you pick and choose under certain slots and categories. Sure. Um, and so again, there are, there are lots of classes that maybe fall under the classical rubric, mm -hmm. drama, art, I think architecture, sure. literature. Uh, but for the most part, the vast majority of the classes focus on the subject matter of interest of the professor who's mm. a scholar and who's publishing sure. and presenting in his or her community. And so that's what we see is that the, the professor teaches classes as if these students are going to become professionals in their particular subfield. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that didn't speak to me and frankly I don't think yeah. it speaks to the majority of, of MIT students. So. You, of course, returned to MIT after having done your graduate studies That's right. and now serve as a professor there. You'll remind me of your title and your department, just for the record. Well, I'm a professor of chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. I hold a chair, a Bador, Raymond Bador chair in chemical engineering. Um, and I, I think one of the subjects of very, very much interest to, to you, part of this conversation, is about 10 years ago I founded a project called the Benjamin Franklin Project, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I also direct that. Right. Yeah, because your surprise, maybe a little discouragement, but your surprise at not finding something you could engage with uh, then prompted you, I assume, to get involved now as a faculty member at MIT to bring about more of that liberal education you'd experienced in the prep school, right, in Memphis? That's right. Uh, what would that look like if, uh, if you were king for a day? <laughs> how, 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 would you, how would you offer a, a form of education to MIT students or to any university student uh, who really could be introduced to these liberal arts? What would, what would be some of the features of that? 
Yeah, so that's a challenge, and, and I guess this afternoon I'll talk a little bit more about that challenge. Um, I, I would say there are maybe two main things that I would do, two categories. First of all, I would have a uh, sequence, however many, maybe it's not eight, maybe it's six, but I would have a sequence of courses that would build upon each other, uh, that would be broad, broad in terms of classical education, right. um, but would also have an emphasis, not a sole emphasis, but a strong emphasis on our understanding of the natural world, including mm -hmm. modern science. Mm -hmm. As you well know, and, and everyone in classical education, um, nature, how we view nature and modern science is a very important part of the tradition of classical yes. education. Uh, and then related to that, for me, the second thing is uh, I would include some of these things within the science and engineering classes. Mm -hmm. um, and those include some of the historical aspects which are relevant, some of the philosophical aspects which are relevant, mm -hmm. and also some of the um, let's say, ethical aspects. Mm -hmm. and, and I differentiate from the philosophical aspects. Let me just give you one example. Okay, please. Um, and, and then we can talk about the challenges if you want. But one example is um, we talk about atomic theory and our students learn about atoms and how they combine to form sure. molecules and how they combine and form properties of systems and chemical systems and mm -hmm. whatnot. On the other hand, we have purely continuum theories like thermodynamics, uh, energy, concepts like that, heat capacity, all kinds of things that students learn probably maybe before high school right, in your schools. Right. Um, well, those don't presume that there are atoms or molecules. Those are purely continuum. Mm -hmm. The world is infinitely divisible. How do those two fit together? And I think teaching students about that partly from an early age, but in particular at the university level, where they expand upon these concepts tremendously that they've learned in, in high school and before that, uh, I think they can start understanding some of the creativity that goes into science mm -hmm. and uh, some of the questions that maybe go beyond what happens in sort of focused research uh, right, in the lab. activities in right. the lab. It's interesting because this notion of a, almost a paradox, right, that there are these elements uh, when we look more closely at uh, the models, that kind of juxtaposition, as you just described, uh, where there is not a, that it might result in a creativity, was, was the term you used. How is it that, that maybe you could give us an example of how that kind of create, the creativity may in fact be the result of a closer investigation of, and a philosophical uh, exploration of the sciences, even while doing full scientific exploration on its own terms. Yes, so I think, I think that's a direction towards creativity. I think the creativity comes by looking at a larger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, let's face it, modern science, as you said, you called it, in the, you said in the lab, and in the lab one focuses on a very, very narrow topic. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually with a very, very narrow, narrow goal in mind. Mm -hmm. um, that's important for science to progress, and we all want sure. it to progress. Sure. We want our medicine to get better, and our health to get better, and the economy to grow, and all those sort of things. Um, but does it need also to progress, does it need some big picture thinking, let's say? Mm -hmm. um, the people just sticking to the example of thermodynamics and atomic theory, I mean, the people who developed that theory were trying to understand the nature of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're trying to understand something very, very small, how one particular protein folds or acts in a certain way, that may be a reflection of trying to understand the world, but it doesn't, it doesn't get you there unless it's done with that in mind, mm -hmm. and therefore your maybe very narrow experiments sure. are designed with the big picture in mind. Have you seen any hopeful signs moving in this direction where there's the continue the focused lab-based experiment and at the same time keep a big picture in mind and try to merge those two? Is there, are, there, are there hopeful signs within the scientific community? Well, I guess if one wants to dig deep enough, one could find some hope anywhere. Uh, <laughs> so so I shouldn't put you on the spot, but, I I, but I'm always looking, right? I'm always wondering, where are we going to go to find this, this kind of balance, uh, this equilibrium? Um, I, I think that, well, there's, there was all these discussions in physics in the 90s, maybe they even started in the 80s, that the end of physics, I think there was a book of that title, and mm -hmm. so physics is over, and right now it's at a 
at somewhat of a standstill, how to go farther than the standard model mm -hmm. and how to go beyond and string theory doesn't seem to be working. And, mm. and so I just choose this one example of physics. So maybe being, to use a classical term, being at an impasse, mm. aporia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, will help, uh, help the field as a sure. whole or particular individuals to try to go beyond that, this more narrow approach and narrow view. Having said that, there are some signs, but I haven't seen a lot of signs. There may be some people who are trying to do that mm. in kind of certain corners, but for sure. the most part, I don't see those Not signs. Not the mainstream, right. No. Well, it's certainly our hope in K-12 classical education that we might raise up a generation that would run off and join you at MIT as undergraduates, maybe graduates, and hopefully begin to take stock of and, uh, and want to see the whole, even as we continue the explorations of modern science. Mm -hmm.